Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Nerdy Movie News Roundup. This is the show where we round up all of the latest news in the world of nerdy movies. Uh, had a good day today, you know? Ate a, ate a torta earlier today. Pretty good stuff. Uh, fucking really big torta. They also gave me french fries along with it. So I had a full on meal. That's all I ate today. I've been doing this thing where I just eat a meal a day. Sometimes. Not every day. But... It usually works out pretty well, because whenever I eat a meal a day, I get to just go ham on, like, (laughs) something really unhealthy. And then I justify it, because it's the only thing I eat for the day. Anyways, you don't care about that. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, we got uh, some interesting stuff to talk about today, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, First up, we got a teaser for Captain America Brave New World. Um, the The movie comes out in February of 2025. I honestly think that the reason why we're getting a a trailer now is so that they can attach it to Deadpool and Wolverine. And honestly, I think that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, I think the trailer looks pretty good. I I don't think it's like amazing or anything, but I I like the tone that they're setting up. I like that they're kind of going back to the Winter Soldier. (laughs) I did not mean to pronounce it like that. The Winter Soldier um, era of things. Actually, let's go back here for a sec. So... We saw um, Harrison Ford as Thunderbolt Ross there, but uh, hold on, let's hit play here. Apparently, this is a this is a Sable Sabra, whatever. What's this lady's name? Apparently, she was like an Israeli superhero, and her now she's been changed to just like generic secret agent person. Uh, because of, uh, you know, reasons and stuff and things. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, but I wanted to show something else here. So apparently this thing back there is, oh God, sorry. Yeah, that, that big thing back there is apparently the hand of the, of the celestial that was coming out of the ground. So that's super cool. Um, it feels like we're finally <laughs> we're finally following up on uh, the Eternals, which is hilarious. Um, and then here we see Isaiah Bradley. He's going he's going rogue. He's like trying to assassinate the president. Now, this uh, like the first thing that you kind of think of when you see this is oh, so it's the Winter Soldier again. At least that's what I'm thinking. We'll see though. I mean, would they really just redo that same exact plot? I mean. It seems unlikely that they would just have Isaiah Bradley try to assassinate the president. I mean, unless the president is like a scroll or something and Isaiah Bradley knows somehow. But I don't know. My guess is that he's being brainwashed somehow. Um, we had a nice shot of Sam kicking some guys. Pretty sure that's the leader. You can kind of, This is like him as well. You can kind of see that his hand is green, right? At least I, I feel like it is. Uh... It feels like his head, it's a little hard to see, but I feel like his head is also kind of green as well. He's supposedly like the main, main villain of the story. But yeah, I mean, I, I like that they have this political thriller vibe. It's it's very much like, you know, he's telling the president at the beginning of the trailer, like, Mr. President, your inner circle is... Oh, this is the scene. He's like, your inner circle has... Oh, no, no, wait, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry, earlier in the trailer, he's like... Your inner circle has been, uh, has been, has been, uh, um, has been invaded, Mr. President. So it's like, there's a conspiracy afoot and whatnot. Very Winter Soldier-esque. Um, which is obviously the, the tone that they should be going for. Cool shot there. He has like a sonic boom thing effect now, which is kind of cool. Uh... And then, yeah, the big trailer shot at the end is, uh, wha-bam, Red Hulk. So, seems like we're getting that. I'm really curious to know what hap- what ex- what exactly happens after this moment. Because it seems like Sam throws the shield at him. He just catches it, throws it into the ground. What exactly does Sam do now? <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, I thought the trailer looked pretty cool, so let me know what you think in the, in the comments down below. Alright, next up. The uh, the Arkham show is apparently dead. So this is coming from Variety. The planned Arkham Asylum TV series is no longer moving forward at the, at max. Variety has learned. 
It is still possible, though, that a new project set within the infamous Gotham City uh, Asylum could be developed in the future, the individual noted. So, very interesting stuff. Um, I can't say I'm all that surprised. So, if you'll remember, this Arkham Asylum show was originally supposed to be a GCPD show that was set within the Matt Reeves Batman universe. It then morphed into an Arkham Asylum show that was set in the Matt Reeves the Batman universe. And then, for whatever reason, it morphed again into an Arkham Asylum show set in the DCU. That being said, it was kind of feeling like we were probably going to get that show before uh, the DCU Batman movie. And that always felt weird to me because I was like, why are we, why would we get an Arkham Asylum show before a Batman movie? That se- it seems like a Batman movie would be setting up an Arkham Asylum show, not vice versa. So I, obviously we don't know exactly what happened behind the scenes, but my guess is it probably had something to do with that is that they probably don't want to move forward with something like that until Batman is established in the DCU. But, you know, who 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 really knows at the end what exactly the reason was. All right, so let's move on to the next story. So we got an we got a bunch of updates actually for Spider-Man or sorry, Spider-Noir. <laughs> we'll get to that. Uh let's read here from the New Yorker. Well, I mean, uh oh, well this is all Nicolas Cage talking. Well, I mean, the fantasy would be that I could try to aspire to be something more Golden Age, you know, something more like James K- Cagney, Cagney, or Humphrey Bogart, or Hedy Lamar, or Bette Davis. I wanted to have that kind of aura, you know, like the more enigmatic, you don't know too much, that's why I'm not on social media. That's the thinking, anyway. I don't know. We'll see what happens if I do this Amazon show, Spider-Man Noir, and they put me in black and white. We'll see if we can get some of that flavor. One of the things that I like about this potential show is that it's fantasy. It's not really uh, people beating people up. Monsters are involved. So this is very interesting. Um, it seems like Nicolas Cage is hinting at the show being in black and white. Now, obviously, um, Spider-Man Noir in the Spider-Verse movies is in black and white. From what I re- Actually, yeah, because I played a game called um, Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, and there were actually levels where you would play as Spider-Man Noir. And those were in black and white as well, so I'm honestly not sure if Spider-Man Noir is just a character that is, that is traditionally drawn in black and white. So maybe they, maybe they like faithfully adapt that into the show. I think it could be really interesting, but it also might be a, a risky choice because I wouldn't be surprised if there were people out there that were like, "I'm not watching a black and white show," you know? I, I don't know. I mean, that would be interesting. <clears throat> it's also interesting that he says that it's a lot that that there's going to be like a fantasy element involved he mentioned monsters so i wonder if yeah maybe there is going to be more mystical stuff involved in this but i mean it's also nicholas cage so he might just be like they, i don't know like maybe like a green goblin is going to be in it and he saw like concept art of the big like hulk-esque green goblin um because i imagine they would go with that version rather than like the high-tech green goblin um, and maybe he sees, like, the monsterish version of Green Goblin, and he's like, yeah, there are monsters in this. So, I don't know. That's a, th- Those are just interesting comments. Um, we'll see uh, what exactly happens. Uh, we also have a casting for uh, for Spider-Noir. Robbie, Robbie Robertson. He has been cast uh, as uh, Lamorne Morris. Or, sorry, that's the opposite. Lamorne Morris, that's the name of the actor, has been cast as Robbie Robertson, the Spider-Man character. It's coming from Deadline. Actor-comedian Lamorne Morris uh, from Fargo has been tapped as a series regular opposite Nicolas Cage in Spider-Noir. On the Sony Pictures TV-produced series, uh, which has been renamed from its original title, Noir, to highlight its Spider-Man universe lineage, Morris will play the character Robbie Robertson. Morris's Robbie Robertson is driven, hardworking, and won't take no for an answer. A dedicated journalist trying to make it with the odds stacked against him as a black professional in 1930s New York, he takes on riskier stories that no one else would touch in order to catch attention and a paycheck. He is willing to do whatever is necessary for his career. So, uh, yeah, this is also interesting. I mean, uh, I don't really know Lamorne Morris, but I mean, you know, I was looking into his projects, stuff like Fargo. I mean, he seems to be a talented actor, so I'm sure he'll be fine. I also like that Robbie Robertson is going to end up being like a prominent character in this series, it looks like. Um, 
Because he's been in a bunch of Spider Man media. <sighs> and he's always a, like a super likable character, but he's never like one of the main main characters. So I feel like that's going to be fun. Just the name Spider Noir is so stupid. <laughs> Just call it Spider Man Noir. <laughs> Why are you taking out the man? <laughs> like they were already going like the arrow route where they're like, we can't say the name Green Arrow. So we got to call it Arrow. In the show, he's going to be called The Hood. It's like, what? Is he just going to be called The Spider in the, in, in the show? It's like, just, just call it Spider-Man. Like, why, <laughs> why not? It's so weird. The only real reason I could think of is maybe, maybe Sony has, like, some kind of agreement with Marvel where they're not allowed to have, like, competing live action spider-man stuff like maybe because of whatever contract they have with marvel they literally cannot have a show that has spider-man in it that's the only thing i can think of though because i mean they can obviously do it with animated stuff because spider the into the spider-verse movies are called spider-man into the spider-verse and spider-man across the spider-verse so spider noir it's stupid but who knows maybe they kind of have to have it be that way all right we also have information on the episode uh, account of the series uh is coming from cbr speaking with the new yorker cage opened up about making the leap to television with noir during the interview cage confirmed that noir would consist of eight episodes each with a runtime averaging 45 minutes 45 minutes i mean it's eight episodes he said so it's the equivalent of four movies in five months so interesting stuff is that i actually went back to that new yorker interview um to try to look for the exact quote it wasn't in it. So I think what happened was he said it and it was in the New Yorker article, but maybe Sony was like, Hey, take that out of there. He wasn't supposed to say that. That's what I'm guessing. Um, but I assume that information is correct. So that's a decent amount of time. I, I, I think, um, that being said, it could be like Marvel. Oh, uh, sorry. Disney plus math where like the Disney plus shows are like, there'll be like 36 minutes, but then there'll be like 10 minutes of credits. So the, the episode is only like 26 minutes. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I really, it, it really is a shame that TV has gone into the point where they, they're just some, for whatever reason, not able to make like hour long TV anymore. Like house of the dragon is really turning out to be one of the more impressive shows. Cause in this, in this new age of like, streaming shows not being able to be proper episodes of television house of the dragon is doing the thing you know what i mean so we'll see oh, hopefully it turns out good all right last thing about spider noir uh the villain has been cast brendan gleason is going to be playing whoever the villain is so this is coming from deadline brendan gleason has joined the cast of the upcoming spider-man noir series at amazon variety has learned from sources Exact details on Gleason's roles are being kept under wraps, but he will reportedly play the show's villain. Uh, I think this is great, you know? As far as who he could play? I don't mean this as an insult, but I could see him as the Green Goblin. <laughs> like the... I mean, like when I say the Green Goblin, like I said, I mentioned before, I'm talking about like the big hulking monster version of Green Goblin. I don't know, I could see I could see them uh, getting uh, Brendan Gleason up in some mocap <laughs> uh, outfits or would he be against that i don't know maybe he would be able to maybe he would want to go all practical he's like hey get me in the makeup i'll work out like a mad dog and i'll get in shape uh probably not though um because now i'm thinking about it would amazon want to pay up the money <laughs> to make a show uh with like a fully cgi villain maybe not maybe not so i don't know maybe hammerhead something like that we'll see though all right, next up, let's talk about The Last of Us Season 2. Uh, we have a bunch of set photos from The Last of Us Season 2, uh, so we're just going to go through them real quick. Here we have Ellie and Dina. If you don't know who Dina is, if you've never played The Last of Us Part 2, she's uh, she's Ellie's friend, um, and she's kind of her, her partner for a lot of the game. So, uh, yeah, I think they look pretty good. You know, do they look exactly like they do in the game? Not really. One thing that people have noticed is that they look very young, <laughs> which is true, but I also have noticed, or I, I looked it up, and Ellie's only, like, 19. 
in The Last of Us Part 2. And Dina's, I think, like, 19 or 20. And it's like, they do look older in that game, to be fair. But I feel like this does look more, they do look more like 19 and 20 year olds (laughs) than they do in the game. So, I don't know. I, I understand people saying that they look too young, but I feel like they look more accurate to what they would actually look like. Um, I think, yeah, this is them not filming (laughs) because uh, Isabella Merced is like in Crocs and whatever. So, so I don't know. I I think overall, um, I like the look so far. Of course, these are also set photos. So who the hell knows what (laughs) the final cut will end up looking like. But we shall see. All right. Next up, let's talk about Cobra Kai uh, and its connection with the upcoming Karate Kid movie. So we have a video here. Let's play it. Uh, hold up. <laughs> um, Ralph, you know I'm greedy with this franchise, so I have to ask about the new Karate Kid movie. I'm curious, are there any new layers of Daniel you unearthed working on that that maybe we can either see in Cobra Kai Season 6 or see the seeds that eventually lead to those qualities? That's a good question. I mean, I can't go into too much detail at this early point. That movie's not hit until... May 30th, 2025. But um, yeah, it was important to me. I mean, mainly to me, it was about uh, always being true to LaRusso's, the the truth. I tried to play truth in 1983 when I played, when I uh, originated this character. And I still always throughout Cobra Kai and in the, the new film, it's about being honest and truthful to the character and what would motivate uh, any of his actions. But what I was able to do is find things from season six that uh, that are not this that are sort of referenced in a way that makes sense if you've watched everything, but is not, you know, just drawing specifically. So it, it helps motivate all the actions and that hopefully will uh, that that thread will be by, the, by the fans in a good way. All right, so um, yeah, that that honestly seems pretty promising. You know, it was really weird when they announced that they were doing a Cobra Kai movie, and it was like, oh, is it going to be like continuing on from Cobra? Is it going to be like uh, related to Cobra Kai? And they were like, no. <laughs> and we were like, why not? That's uh, stupid. Why wouldn't you do that? And they were just like, eh, because because we're, we're not doing it. Um. But then, yeah, I think I remember there being, like, some reports of their them kind of changing their tunes on that. I would imagine that, um, oh, God, what's his name? I don't remember. But, the yeah, the, the guy that plays Daniel LaRusso, you have to imagine that he was probably vocal at some point of being like, hey, this is really, st- it would be really stupid for us not to, like, tie into Cobra Kai in some way. So I appreciate that answer. I, I like that. If you if you're watching Cobra Kai and then you watch the Karate Kid movie, there are going to be little threads that tie into each other. You're not going to have to have seen Cobra Kai in order to watch the Karate Kid movie, but you know it'll you'll 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 be able to appreciate more of it if you have. So I think that's I think that's fun and uh, and hopefully hopefully it turns out okay. Uh, okay, next up. X-Men 97 has a new writer. This is coming from Deadline. Matthew Chauncey from What If has been tapped to write Season 3 of Disney Plus's X-Men 97. Marvel Animation's revival of the classic 90s animated series. Sources tell Deadline. Chauncey succeeds Bo DiMeo, who parted ways with Marvel earlier this year. Ahead of X-Men 97's March 20th premiere, after completing work on both Season 1 and Season 2, Chauncey will work alongside X-Men 97 director Jake Castorena, who has been on the animated follow-up from the start. Larry Houston and Eric Julia Lould, uh, executive produced on the original X-Men the Animated Series, will remain on a consulting uh, on as consulting producers. Season 2 of the revival, whose scripts have reportedly been revised, is in production. Season 3 is in development. So, this is uh, not great news. I mean... The Bo de Mayo elephant in the room. What did he do? <laughs> I mean, like, that's the thing. I I can't feel too sad about the fact that he's not coming back. 
considering I don't know what he did and they it still hasn't come out. I'm, I'm shocked that reports have not come out uh, confirming what he did or didn't do. You know, there were reports about how um, about how maybe it was because he has an OnlyFans. Doesn't seem likely to me, but that's possible. There were reports about how he uh, he was like difficult to work with, and it's like okay, I get it, but also he delivered the best Marvel thing in years, so maybe uh, g- get it to work. So I don't know, man. It's uh, it's unfortunate. And this Matthew Chauncey guy, I'm sure he's a nice guy. Maybe, hopefully he doesn't have an OnlyFans, and hopefully, uh, hopefully he doesn't have an he doesn't become abusive or whatever. He's hopefully he's easy to work with. But uh, what if isn't that great? You know, it's not terrible. But I, uh, the guy from What If is not exactly the guy that I want writing X Men uh, X Men ninety seven uh, season three. I mean, it's just not. No offense. So, I don't know, man. I don't know. Because uh, apparently he also wrote, or at least he worked on Thor Ragnarok, not Ragnarok, um, Love and Thunder as well, which is not the best. So, oh uh, man, I, I'd, be, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't worried about about the show. Am I say, Am I sitting here saying, like, you need to bring back Bo DeMeo? Fortunately not, because I just, I don't know what he did. So, it's hard to, I, I can't exactly back the guy. Like, I, I, I would need to know what he did first before I can, like, hardcore demand his return. Um, so we'll see. But uh, but hopefully hopefully this Matthew Chauncey guy is able to uh, he's able to do a good season three. Because the one thing that I will say is that what if it's definitely would, – it would be a difficult series to work on. Because you have to tell a complete story in, like, 26 minutes, right? Each story, each episode is its own individual story, so – that's definitely a challenge, but um, he didn't rise up to it. <laughs> so that's what I kind of have to judge him on. But we'll see. We shall see. Speaking of writers, uh, Sean Levy also has a writer for his alleged Star Wars film. It's coming from Deadline. Deadline has confirmed that the Sean Levy-directed Star Wars movie is being penned by Jonathan Tropper. Tropper has a long history with Levy, having written his Netflix movie The Atom Project. On TV, Tropper created the Cinemax crime thriller series Banshee, as well as Warrior, and was a showrunner and scribe on Apple TV Plus's Jason Momoa series C. So yeah, Sean Levy, he's uh, he is of course the guy who's currently directing, uh, or yeah, he's he directed and it's coming out, um, Deadpool and Wolverine. So he's uh, kind of a, a hot cookie on the block, as the kids say. Um, you know, we've been hearing early reactions, and they've been very positive. Uh, of course, we've heard positive early reactions for many films. So I don't know how much that means, but we'll see. But assuming that Sean Levy, like, knocks Deadpool and Wolverine out of the park, you know, his Star Wars movie is going to be, like, a really big deal. And it seems like he's working with a familiar guy, so... I mean, it's good news, you know. I haven't seen Warrior. I've heard it's very good. I haven't seen Banshee. I've heard it's very good. So he's clearly a competent guy. I just, I also just don't really have faith in Lucasfilm, right? Like, they keep on announcing all of these projects with, you know, talented directors and writers. And the projects just don't come to fruition. So I'm not going to get excited or anything like that, honestly, until I'm, like, in the in the cinema. And the movie has started... I'm not I, like I can't get invested in any Star Wars project. Um, honestly, I I can't say that I can get in that I'm going to get invested until like the credits start rolling because at any time Kathleen Kennedy can like run into the uh, run into the, the the theater and like steal the movie, be like, hey, <laughs> we we change our minds, we're not actually releasing it. You know what I mean? So we'll see though. Uh, let's move on to the next story. Penguin and Dune Prophecy, uh, they are being switched to HBO Originals. This is coming from uh, from Deadline. Last month, Warner Brothers Discovery shifted three of its highest profile Max Originals, Harry Potter, Lanterns, and It prequel Welcome to the Dairy, to become HBO Originals. The company is now continuing this shift with the movie, uh, or, or sorry, this shift with the move of The Penguin and Dune Prophecy. Both shows will now premiere on HBO as well as launching on its Max streaming service. 
It is part of a strategy to rebrand its highest profile titles into HBO originals, giving them a linear airing on the premium cable network as well as a streaming bow. So I I honestly think that what they're doing here is very smart because if you remember, Max used to be called HBO Max and then they <laughs> took the HBO out of it and were like, it's Max now, guys, get excited. And people made fun of them. Uh, and I understand why, because it, it the Max name is stupid. Like, if you were going to take out HBO, give it some, give it a better name, right? Um, but I do understand the desire to take HBO out of the branding of the streaming service. Because while in the short term, HBO is one of the most respected uh, brands on TV. I mean, it really is. But when you say HBO, you used to just think of, like, The Sopranos and Game of Thrones and The Wire and, you know, some of the greatest TV shows of all time. But back when HBO Max started, you started, uh, you, you started, when, when you say HBO, you started thinking of stuff like Velma. And, you know, a bunch of, like, Cartoon Network shows that are on there. And when they, when Warner Brothers, or when Discovery bought Warner Brothers, you started associating it with a bunch of reality TV nonsense. And the reality is, is that that's, you probably don't want all of that stuff to be associated with HBO. Not saying that that stuff is necessarily bad, but it's not HBO. So I think that in the short term, they were probably capitalizing on, on the HBO branding. But I think in the long term, they would have ended up harming the reputation of HBO. It wouldn't mean anything, right? Because, you know, before HBO Max, you say that, hey, there's a new HBO show coming out. That carried a lot of weight. A lot of people would probably give it a chance just because an HBO show. Once HBO Max started putting out content, you saying that an H- that something was an HBO show didn't mean anything. So I respect this a lot. I, I, I think that it's probably smart at the end of the day to not have everything on max be related to the HBO branding so that now when when we when we uh, read that oh this show is being turned into an HBO original that means something so we'll see though how it ends up coming to fruition all right so that's everything that's all the news let's get into what I've been watching um I finished Metroid Fusion so yeah, this was a game on the uh, Game Boy Advance. It, uh, it's a little side-scroller. It's a Metroidvania, of course. Um, I really enjoyed it. So uh, this is the first Metroid game I've played, actually. I think I've tried the original Metroid, um, but I never I never got through it because it was like just very obtuse <laughs> and whatnot. Metroid Fusion is awesome. So um, the one thing I will say <laughs> is that I'm an idiot because... I wanted to play the Metroid games in, like, chronological order, and apparently I was supposed to start with Metroid Zero Mission. Somehow I ended up downloading Metroid Fusion. They're both on the GBA, but Metroid Zero Mission is apparently a remake of the original Metroid. And this is just not that. This is, like, apparently one of the games that's the latest in the timeline. So I'm an idiot. I played this first. But yeah, I still had a good time. I will say, though, it's not really a Metroidvania, I feel like. It feel, it's very linear. Like, there are Metroidvania elements where it's like you go to an area and there are things you can't do. And then once you... Uh, and then you once you get an ability, you can go back and, you know, go to different areas that you couldn't go to before. You know, it does have some of that Metroidvania element to it. But it's also very linear in the sense that the game is always telling you, like, hey, go here. Okay, you went here and you performed the mission. Okay, now go over here. And it was always directing you somewhere. Which, is it the worst thing in the world? Because, like, it was like, okay, well, I still like this. It's it's almost like a level-based system. But it doesn't have that sense of exploration that a Metroidvania does. Um, so, I don't know. If you're maybe wanting to go into it because, you know, when because you're familiar with the Metroidvania style, it's just not really that. Um, but, yeah, the combat is super fun. Uh, the bosses are cool. Uh, what the big, uh, like the, probably the coolest thing about this game is that there is like a, like a clone of Samus that's running around the ship that you're on and it's a clone of Samus. It's like evil. It's going it, to like, if it sees you, it'll try to kill you and you're not powerful enough yet to even be able to fight it. So for a lot of the game, some of, 
you know, it's almost like a horror a horror game at at points where like if you if, if you walk into a room and you see the clone, it's like, oh shit, uh, and then you run away. Um and it'll chase after you too, so it's it's cute. I I, I really liked it. Um I'm probably gonna play Metroid Zero Mission next. <laughs> and hopefully not fuck it up. So we'll see. Um I also started playing Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga, if you don't know uh, what this game is, it is a Mario RPG. Um, and I'm pretty early on in the game, but uh, I'm really liking it so far. It is a... I'm playing the one on the GBA. And basically, the the neatest thing about the Mario and Luigi games is that the the combat is turn-based, but it's, like, still real... There are still real-time elements. So, like, you you're you're always active about something. So when you're in combat and the enemy attacks you, you actually have to, like, jump out of the way and stuff like that. Um, And that one element makes me so much more invested in it from a gameplay perspective because I'm not a huge fan of, like, the kinds of games where, you know, you press some buttons and you attack and your character just does it for you and then then they're going to attack you and you just kind of have to stand there like a moron and get hit. It's like, I don't know. And the, the, those those kinds of games aren't necessarily for me. The active element of, of a Mario and Luigi, it just makes me so much more engaged. And then, yeah, you know, the dialogue is really cute and fun. I love how expressive Mario and Luigi are. Like, they really feel like they have personalities in, in, in the game. And, you know, like, Mario is, like, if if something bad happens, Mario and Luigi have, like, really vivid expressions of like oh shock or terror or happiness and whatnot and they also like they also like talk kind of like you you don't really understand what they say but you see mario and luigi talking to other characters like like they'll be like they'll be like ababa da ababa do ba 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 woo you know like they'll make italian noises like that and you know it's just a such so much to to give them personalities it's like Playing this game is if it, it feels like you're you're playing through a Mario like Saturday morning cartoon, which is really cool. Like I haven't played the Paper Mario games. I haven't played um, Mario RPG, so maybe maybe those games are like this as well. But based on what I've seen from them, it still does seem like m- when you play as Mario, it, he's a very much like a like a silent. NPC that doesn't have much of a personality and you know I understand that that's kind of part of what a lot of RPGs are where you're supposed to sort of put your own yourself into the game and I get that but I I just really like that Mario and Luigi have very defined and expressive personalities and yeah just the fact that it's a game where you're adventuring with Mario and Luigi is just really cool as well like I don't know that's having Luigi be along for the ride is just really fun too so I'm really loving it. Um, Yeah, I I highly recommend it. All right, next up, I watched House of the Dragon, Season 2, Episode 4. We're here, boys. The war has officially begun. So I said last week that I was like, man, I like the show. You know, I'm enjoying it. But I feel like they're dilly-dallying a little too much. Like, we all know that where this is going. The war is going to start. Let's get to the war. And got to it, we did. Because uh, there were some pretty large-scale battles here. Dragons fucking each other up. Uh, I, I, You know what I really like about, about the show? Is the way that they treat dragons like they're like nuclear weapons. <laughs> Where they're like... I mean, it, a, a lot of it most likely has to do with budgeting and stuff like that. But I kind of like how the characters are like, Listen, we can't just bring out dragons. Because once we bring out dragons they're going to bring out dragons and untold like mass destruction will occur. So I really like the way that they treat dragons in in, in the show, but yeah, uh, I mean, everything else was super compelling as well. We got some like really surprising character moments, character deaths, (laughs) you know what I mean? Um, And uh, you know, you don't necessarily see them coming, but, I will say I did get some of them spoiled for me. Like, I don't think I would necessarily would have seen those characters dying, but I I did get some of it spoiled for me, which is super unfortunate. But yeah, the way that they handle the character deaths are like, man, I don't want to see you die. And then the other death is like, 
I mean, I'm okay with seeing you die. <laughs> um, although one of them is probably not dead, I will say. I'll just put that out there. I don't think he's dead. Um, and uh, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully next week uh, we uh, we get some uh, some more war wartime stuff. Um, and yeah, like by, by by the end of the episode, there are like a lot of characters where it's like, you guys are probably gonna start clashing, right? And I'm and I'm wondering like like there's a character that kills another character and I'm wondering like did he see that explicitly is he gonna like is he gonna go after him for killing his, uh you know the person that he kills it's all very interesting so we'll see what happens in the next episode though all right next up I watched My Adventures with Superman season two episode eight uh I really like this episode this episode was a lot darker than I feel like any other episode of My Adventures with Superman because. You know, we deal with Brainiac taking over uh, Clark's mind, and Clark is going sicko mode. He, um, I, I really like the the scenes of Brainiac, um, like really like psychoanalyzing super, Superman, and he's like basically playing to all of Clark's biggest fears of being lonely on Earth, of not feeling like he's going to be accepted. And I, I gotta say, man, I know. You know, the 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 thing with Lois and Clark and them like kind of breaking up, um, and well, Lois breaking up with him is that at the time that it happened, it was a little bit like okay. I mean, I understand the feelings that are here, and I understand that if you probably if they would have had a chance to talk it over a little bit more, things might have gone down differently. But man, does it really hit hard? Like it, it really sets up this episode well, where. Brainiac brings up that moment where, where where Lois, you know, kind of breaks up with him, and he's like, "They don't accept you, dude. They don't. They don't love you." And it's like, "Damn, that really hit hard." But yeah, and then when when they have Clark just beating the shit out of <laughs> out of Supergirl, it's 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 scary, man. It really is. Uh, but yeah, I absolutely love the show. I love uh, I love all the characters. Like this this show really does really great job with its characters for sure. Um, and the fact that I, I, I want everybody to, to, to love and, and appreciate one another. Um, unlike <laughs> the Acolyte. So we got episode seven. Um, I didn't mind this episode. The thing is, is that... <laughs> unlike my adventures with Superman, I just don't necessarily care that much about these characters. Is really the ultimate problem with it. Because it's like, this episode was good. Like, I liked it. I liked the the answers that they gave to what happened on that fateful night. And I just, you know, we're, it's the penultimate episode. I don't know what exactly it's going to lead up to. That's going to make this season feel worthwhile. Cause it's just like, when you get to the, like the a plot, it's like, okay, the Sith guy just wants an acolyte. That's literally his only motivation. And, uh, I don't know that I necessarily care that much about their relationship, the Sith guy and May's relationship. They didn't show it to us, really. I mean, I guess they kind of did when he was pretending to be the the crook or whatever, but they didn't make us invested in that relationship. Um, you know, you have a soul feeling guilt over, you know, what happened on that night, and he desperately wants to um, do right by Osha, but it's like, you didn't do enough to make me care about Soul and Dosha. It's like, okay. You just, you, you, you like, it, like you showed, like, back, or like, flashbacks of when they first met. You're showing flashbacks of when they're meeting up again now in the present. But we get none of the middle of them building up a relationship with one another. We, they never even really showed us why Osha left the Jedi Order, which is, like, you just didn't do enough character work for, to get me to care about about this about, about the series about these characters so i like the i like the episode i like that they really established that you know the jedi aren't bad people because i know that's a problem that a lot of people had but they were flawed and um but yeah the other big problem though i will say is that they make the jedi kind of stupid like receding hairline guy like he his whole thing of being like I don't want to be here. I want to weave the plan. I want to go back to Coruscant. I'm a big baby. I'm a little baby. 
like that was just really stupid and it, uh, that that comes down to bad writing as opposed to the characters just being flawed um you know there was that really dumb moment where like they reveal that the platforms that may and osha were on they start crumbling and soul is holding up the platforms with the force when in reality he could have just picked up the girls with the force because he, he then ends up having to sacrifice May, and it's just kind of stupid. So, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is. I don't hate the series. I, you know, I'd probably give it a 6 out of 10. Uh, then, you know, obviously we'll have to wait for the finale. But it, it's just a little underwhelming at the end of the day. All right. Last thing we're talking about today. I watched The Boys Season 4, Episode 7. Uh, it's better than The Acolyte. But I do kind of feel similarly, I guess. And what I'll say about The Boys Season 4 is that it really does feel like a filler season so far. Where it's not bad. Again, I just want to establish this is way better than The Acolyte. I'm not, I don't even want to make <laughs> make the comparison. But yeah, it's not bad. Like, I like everything that I'm seeing. I, I like all the character progressions. I guess it just doesn't feel like we're heading up to a season finale. It really, this, this season just really feels like a lot of setup for Season 5. Without being like a really impactful season in its own regard. And I am a little more... I became a little more okay with it once I real, once I learned that Season 5 is going to be the final season. Because if Season 5 wasn't going to be the final season... I think I would have probably had the... Sorry. I would be giving the take right now that... Oh man, the boys is going on for too long. They like ran out of ideas. And to some extent they did. Like they clearly don't, they just don't have enough ideas to make a really banger season four and a really banger season five. It really does feel like they, uh, they were like, well, we kind of just got to get to season five. (laughs) We got to stretch whatever we're doing here out long enough so that we can have a season four. And then in season five, we'll really come home with like the proper confrontations and all that. So we'll see. Next next week is the season finale. Um, the season finale could be a banger, but I it, again, it just really does feel like set up for season five. But we shall see. And with that, that's gonna be end. Uh, that's gonna be the end of Nerdy Movie News Roundup. It is the show where we round up all the latest news in the world of nerdy movies. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think about any and all of the topics we've discussed here today, and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.